Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Generation Tech and part four in our series of the real size of Star Wars ships. This week, we're looking at Republic vessels, i.e. the good guys during the Clone Wars before they went and painted all their ships this whitish gray, added scary music, working conditions got way more hazardous, they started rolling their R's. We will deal with your rebel friends soon enough. Started oppressing cute furry aliens. What? Developed a fetish for choking. You are in command now, Admiral Yet. And became the Galactic Empire. Seriously, those guys must have been being hit with cancer-causing radiation every time that thing fired. I mean, they must have had an amazing healthcare plan. Otherwise, they would have unionized for sure. Anyway, back to the topic. Now, you'll notice that many of these ships look similar to the Star Destroyers used by the Galactic Empire later on. That's because all of the Imperial ships were developed out of the same military industrial complex used by the Republic. First, we'll look at the Acclimator class assault ship. This ship was first used at the Battle of Geonosis to transport the new clone army to the theater of war. It was about 750 meters long. That's about double the length of the US supercarriers. It carried 16,000 clone troopers. To put that in perspective, the US Navy's amphibious assault ships like the USS America carry only 1,600 Marines. That's 10% of what the Acclimator class could carry. These ships also carried a complement of low altitude assault transport craft. The craft were roughly comparable in size to a Chinook helicopter as used by the US and British militaries, but with side doors that could be kept open in flight mode reminiscent of the smaller Black Hawk helicopter. Now let's look at the Venator class Star Destroyer. The ship was 1,155 meters long. That's four times as long as the US supercarriers like the USS Enterprise. That's not it. That's better. But if we are dissing Star Trek, it's almost twice as long as the USS Enterprise 1701E. The Venator class, according to legends, had a range of 60,000 light years. The Star Wars galaxy, like our own galaxy, was a bit over 100,000 light years across. So if the ship started at Coruscant, it could make its way out to most of the main worlds in episodes one, two, and three without needing to refuel. Anyway, the ship was a carrier and would carry a complement of V-wing fighters. V-wings were a similar size to human jet fighters, but had a top speed of 32,000 miles per hour. To put that in perspective, this thing has a top speed of 17,500 miles per hour. What a puny, inferior vehicle. V-wings, although designed to be fast in combat, didn't have hyperdrive systems or life support, so pilots had to wear full spacesuits like the pilots of the later TIE fighters did. V-Wings were armed with dual laser cannons and Darth Vader would use a black version of the V-Wing for years after the Clone Wars before the newer TIE Fighters were introduced. The Venator class carrier also carried Eta II Actis class interceptors. These were sometimes known as Jedi Fighters due to their extensive use by the Jedi leading squadrons in battle. The small fighters were armed with laser cannons and ion cannons to disrupt the electrical systems of their targets. Anakin flew one at the Battle of Coruscant. Another Jedi starfighter was the Delta Seven. that was operated by Qui-Gon Jinn as well as Obi-Wan Kenobi. These starfighters were designed especially for the Jedi, and the controls were super sensitive because the Jedi could use the Force to aid their control of the ship. They also came with ample trunk space, where you could store some spare parts. The Delta Seven was painted red to represent the diplomatic immunity of the Jedi. The yellow version, piloted by Anakin in the Clone Wars TV series, was a later version, the Delta Seven V. All these Jedi starfighters didn't have built-in hyperdrives. They instead relied on hyperspace transport rings to make the jump to light speed. They also all had a slot for an astromech droid. But choose your droid wisely. Plot a course out of here and prep the hyperdrive engines. What are you doing? I said prep them, not drop them. The last starfighter we're going to look at today is the Arc 170. This was kind of a predecessor to the X-Wing and it was carried by the Venator class Star Destroyer. The ship had a three-man crew, a pilot, a co-pilot, and a tail gunner, as well as an astromech droid. It was designed with a similar purpose to the X-Wing, to both fight battles and perform deep space missions. The craft was armed with four laser cannons and proton torpedoes. During battle, these flaps, known as S-foils, would open to cool the ship and let heat disperse from the laser cannons. So pilots could say the third most iconic line in Star Wars after I am your father and It's a trap! 
the line they say when you know something's about to go down. Lock air spoils in attack position. Now let's get back to some large ships. The Victory One class Star Destroyer was the predecessor of the Imperial Star Destroyer. The ship was a collaborative effort between Rendili Star Drive and the Kuat Drive Yards. It used LF9 engines provided by the Alderant Royal Engineers. But these engines were found to be underpowered and were replaced for the Victory 2 with iron engines from Horse Kessel Driveworks Incorporated. This company originally made ships for the Trade Federation, but according to legends, the company was sold off after the Trade Federation's defeat. The Victory class was 900 meters long, so just over half the length of the later Imperial Star Destroyer. Only the Victory 1 saw some sort of use during the Clone Wars, with the Victory 2 introduced during the Rise of the Empire era. They were both later rendered obsolete by the Imperial Star Destroyer. But there is one more ship we have to talk about, and that is the Mandator 2 class Star Dreadnought, of which the prototype was named Pride of the Core. It was built by the Kuat Drive Yards after they started exclusively building ships for the Galactic Republic, and was based on their own Mandator class ship that formed part of the Kuat Sector's defense force. At 8 kilometers long, it was the Republic's biggest vessel. If it flew past you, it would probably take as long as this ship from Spaceballs. freaking massive ship, but it didn't see action during the key battles of the Clone Wars. The Mandator class paved the way for later star dreadnoughts like the Executor class, the one that was the size of Manhattan. So guys, I hope you've enjoyed this rundown of some of the ships of the Republic fleet. If you like this kind of thing, why not check out the Dorling Kindersley books Ultimate Star Wars and Star Wars Complete Cross Sections on Amazon.com. These two books give info on the battles and events mentioned in this and our other videos, and also specifications and facts about all of the spacecraft and vehicles that we've talked about. I'll put links to those two books in the description section of this video. Of course, you can go and search them on Amazon yourself, but if you buy them through our links, we get a small commission, but it helps us to keep making content for YouTube. Guys, please leave your comments in the comments section below. Please subscribe, and if you're watching this, you are Generation Tech. Guys, thanks so much to everyone who's supporting us on Patreon. If you'd like to find out more about our Patreon campaign or even support our videos, please click the link on screen and in the description. Thanks so much again, guys.